Greetings and welcome to the latest edition of the Theogenic Evolution Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Martin, and I'm happy to have you with me today. For this week's episode, we are joined by Magda from way over there and up there in Canada. She is someone who facilitates 5-MeO-DMT experiences up there and also works with Daniel Schmidt at the Samadhi Center. And we're going to be talking all about her own personal history and entry into medicine work, as well as what she does there at the Samadhi Center and working with meditation and iboga and then topping it off with 5-MeO-DMT. It was a very interesting conversation and I hope that you will enjoy it. We'll get to it in just a couple minutes. But first, of course, some announcements. As usual, when I receive a donation, I like to thank that person. And so this week, thanks goes out to Brooke, who every month makes a small monthly donation via uh, PayPal. It's all set up automatically for Brooke, and so it just comes right on through. And so thank you very much, Brooke, for your longstanding support of the podcast. If you would like to support this podcast, as I always like to remind you, it's quite easy. Just stop by my personal webpage at martinball.net, and you can use the PayPal link at the top right of the page, or join up as a member over at Patreon and choose the monthly support level that best fits you and your level of support and interest and financial means, of course. Just to let you know about what's going to be coming up here on the podcast, we've got lots of exciting stuff. I already have an interview in the bank with Daniel Carcillo, and he is the CEO of Wasana Health. We spoke the other week, and so I've got that interview, and it's all ready to go for you coming up on the podcast. And uh, coming up very shortly, actually in just a couple days, I'm going to be speaking with Rack Razam and interviewing him about facilitating 5-MeO-DMT because uh, we're going to use that interview as part of the Facilitating 5-MeO-DMT anthology book that I'm currently working on. And then coming up after that, we're going to be doing the same thing with Susie Calypso, who runs the Temple of Eden down in Southern California, which is a 5-MeO-DMT church. And I'll be interviewing Susie about what goes on there at the temple and her own background and experience uh, with 5-MeO-DMT. And that will also be transcribed and made part of the book, which, just to let you know, is going extremely well. Um, I'm still collecting some submissions, but I already have quite a few of them and I've been editing them and formatting them and putting them all together into a book. And over the past week, I've been writing an introduction to it and I'm really excited about this project and, um, going to be making some new art to go with the book and designing the book cover and, you know, doing all that stuff. So it's still a ways out before the book is going to be available, but just to let you know, it's taking shape very nicely. So really excited about that. And so, um, keeping me busy, which is always fun. And of course, speaking of 5-MeO-DMT or any other psychedelics out there, if you or someone you know needs some help, uh, reflecting on their experience, integrating their experience, or even preparing for, um, I of course am available for 30, 60, and 90 minute video call consultations. You can go over to nondualandtheogenicintegration.com if you want more details over there. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to speak with people from around the world about their experiences and help them sort through just what's going on. You know? Anyway, let's go ahead and jump into this conversation with Magda. This was actually take two on our interview. We recorded it once and there were some things that um, she wasn't... Uh, quite comfortable with from that first interview and wasn't quite happy with. So we went ahead and we redid the interview and here's the result. Hope you enjoy and uh, hope you're doing well wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life. Hope you're doing well. Okay, let's give it a listen. Well, welcoming on to the Entheogenic Evolution podcast today, Magda And this is actually our second take on our interview. So we're going to kind of redo our conversation that we had before and maybe get into some new territory. Who knows? But um, the whole inspiration for having Magda on the show is not only is she a fascinating, wonderful, lovely woman, um, but part of the inspiration was that um, Magda works at the Samadhi Center with Daniel Schmidt, who was formerly interviewed on the podcast. And... Um, Magda is the one who serves people 5-MeO-DMT at the end of their, what is it, seven-day, nine-day 
meditation. Ten days. Oh, I'm off. Ten day meditation with microdosing of iboga and then topping it all off with some 5-MeO. And also, the inspiration for having Magda on the show is that she is one of the collaborators who is um, part of this anthology book project that I'm currently working on, on facilitating 5-MeO DMT. So she's one of the people who has submitted material for me. And um, the thought of having her on the show and getting the book started is what really inspired having Magda on. So Magda, um, welcome and welcome back. <laughs> oh, thank you. And thank you again. <laughs> it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and a uh, great uh, opportunity to, um, to talk with you about 5-MeO-DMT. And you are so kind and um, interested in human's journey um, that took me a little bit by surprise last time. Mm. <laughs> and we ventured into territory that I was not really prepared to open up and talk. Um, but I am now. So uh, let's have beginner's mind. And there is a, there is this saying, or I read somewhere, that a child will uh, walk the same path every day, let's say to, to school or kindergarten, and they will see a flower on the road. And each day they will stop and admire this flower. It's like they had they seen it for the very first time. So we will we will kind of redo our conversation too and, and be as authentic as possible to uh, to have the full um, experience of uh, what I do perhaps. Yeah, well, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, it's interesting having these kinds of conversations because I always am really interested in people's personal lives and personal story because we are all these unique, beautiful individuals who have experienced joy and tragedy and suffering and success. And we're all a mix of these things. And it's, you know, it's an area where I've always been very open in my own life. You know, I've always been very, um, I like to think of myself as sort of an open book that I, I present my life to my audience and I don't hold back. And sometimes that gets me in trouble and sometimes, you know, it doesn't. Um, but it's just, it's been my approach. And so in inviting people onto the podcast and when I want to dig into people's lives that sometimes it gets into, you know, sensitive personal areas because we are these complex beings. And so that's kind of what we got into last time. And I know that uh, it was a little bit of a surprise and uncomfortable for you. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes uh, I, I don't necessarily want to apologize for making people uncomfortable because, you know, I'm just I'm just being myself and doing my thing. But I also do want my guests to feel comfortable and I, I would not accept apologies because they're absolutely unnecessary. My life is uh, the way it is, and healing is my m most for priority in life. So having that opportunity to see something that I was not aware to this extent within myself gave me nothing but opportunity to heal deeper. So thank you so very much for all your questions, all your curiosity. It paid really, really well in my case. Mm, well, beautiful. Beautiful. So, yeah, so let's kind of do the redo. And um, so kind of I think where we started was I was just sort of asking you about your own personal background, your own life. And I mean, we can even just start with <clears throat> Magda. Where where does, um, you know, obviously the, it's not a typical Anglo-Saxon name. You obviously speak with a little bit of an accent. Um, so maybe let's just start with where where do you come from? in the world originally and you're you're in Canada now but this this is not where you originally come from so maybe we can back up earlier into your life that that's that's correct thank you um so i always say um two things i probably will never change one thing for sure and the other one oh with with a lot of work i may so the shape of my head is eastern european <laughs> i call it egg shape <laughs> <laughs> That's a give and take away, is I guess I am. And the second one is my accent. So yes, no matter how, how many years I speak English and um, I, I feel much more fluent in English than in Polish. I am from Poland. 
Um, yet there are days I do not speak English at all. So yes, I uh, came to Canada many, many years ago, over 30 years ago, very young, very fresh, um, uh, with quite a bit of uh, personal instability. So I was, I believe, 18 or 19 when I crossed uh, the big pond um, by myself. Um, I had sister already here. So it was easier landing than being um, being just alone. Mm-hmm. Yet I spoke German, a Russian, and Polish, but no English. So that was that was quite uh, literally a big obstacle. And um, my stay in Canada was granted by um, uh, someone. Actually, I had to go to um, consulate in um, New York City, and um, I was giving very straightforward ultimatum: um, I will see you in nine months if you don't speak English and don't. Uh, Converse with me uh, clearly, um, you're not staying. So I had no choice but to learn English very quickly, as I did. But um, um, we were talking last time a little bit about the troubles that uh, Magda was experiencing, and mm-hmm. these were mental issues, and uh, these are not easy for me to share and talk about. Um, and I thought coming out, so to speak, in a, in in a, my submission, uh, my book submission, was very brave. Um, but I am ready to speak about it because there is beauty also in overcoming mental instability especially suicidal depression that I experienced since I was five years old. I remember very vividly looking for means to end my life at five. And and it wasn't um, all my life um, so strong and, and so dramatic. I had good times. I had better days. But it was always lurking um, on, on the somewhere inside of me, that feeling of not being complete or feeling of being terribly lonely, um, not a good person, and so on and so forth. And, and that suicidal thoughts were always lingering around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And was there a cause that you can identify for that? I mean, five years old, that, that's so young to be developing those kinds of thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. Was that related to your living situation or, or was it just part of you was kind of digging away at sort of this darkness? Mm, well, I was born in a very, very particular environment. Um, we, at that time, we were Jehovah Witness um, oh. in terms of religion and very much, very much submitted to um, to the truth of that religion. Um, also, I'll be um, very forthcoming right now. Um, with sharing something, not necessarily fully by name, but my father embodied a very particular um, archetype to come here and um, and and uh, live, experience a life of that um, which I will perhaps simply call the Lord of the Darkness. Hmm. So everything was based on Old Testament and then venturing a little bit into the New Testament, uh, great fear of God, of love, of um, anything that is new. So darkness was pretty much everywhere that I could um, look and reach. And family unit is so important in young person's uh, development that we don't look to teachers, we don't look to neighbors, we, we look up to our parents, no matter how difficult it is. And also in child's understanding, there was nothing really difficult. It was the life that we were living until later on, um, I realized that no, uh, this is completely um, hell created by the master. Wow. So uh, that was one one part of um, of of um, the suicidal ideation when it came from, and the other one I lived in many different dimensions, so to speak. When I was child, I remembered a lot before uh, before being incarnated. I um, remembered who I was, and comparing myself to who I was and who I am now as human being didn't compute at all. I wanted to go back. Another part to to this this whole story was my connection to extraterrestrial family that I remember being a part of them. 
and they would visit me and um, we had great time together um, in a language that is non-spoken, not human, is vibrational, is uh, um, it's a beautiful language of uh, t- telepathy and uh, music, I would even say. And uh, when I was about six, um, they told me they won't be coming anymore. I need to start my human life. And I just turned around and looked for help. Who do I call for help? And there was literally nobody that I could, my heart would long for and say, this person is the one who will, will keep me safe. So this this basically what happened to Magda when she was very young. So no wonder there were some terrible, terrible thoughts crossing my mind. Yeah, and I'm just imagining it. If I'm, I'm, I'm gonna guess that probably you didn't share a lot of this with your parents because none of that fits within Jehovah's Witness. Um, I mean, and I'm even surprised to hear that you were your family was Jehovah's Witness in uh, Poland. I didn't realize that actually this religion had made inroads there. I mean, it's a very American form of yes. Christianity. Um, but yeah, sort of you're this young sort of interdimensional being living this very rich life that is not the very narrow view of Jehovah's Witness and then being in a sense sort of abandoned, sort of that, that the child growing up and, and no longer having that connection. Um, you know, I'm reminded of something that happened to myself when, when I was, I don't even know how young I was. Um, but it was pretty early on where um, I had several different quote unquote imaginary friends as a child and something kind of similar happened to me where I had uh, this friend that was a dragon. I mean, this happened so long ago that I can't tell you any details about what this friend was like other than that there was one morning where I woke up and I was just in tears because I knew that the dragon was gone and my dad comes into my room and he's like, Martin, what's wrong? And he's like, Oh, my dragon's gone. And I'm just bawling. I mean, I was just devastated because this, this was a companion to me and I knew it was no longer a part of my life. I mean, it, I just woke up with that realization and my dad went and found like a little dragon toy somewhere else in the house and brought it back. He's like, no, here's your dragon. I was like, that's not it, dad. And I never explained it to him, but in, in sort of a minor way, I think that it's kind of similar to what you're describing of that, that feeling of companionship and con- connection that suddenly is gone and now you're being forced to know you've got to be this girl in this household in this life and you didn't f- fit. I, I Not only that I didn't fit, I didn't want to fit. Yeah. Uh, and and that was that was the turning point, I think, where um, the human structure and conditioning really started uh, taking place, where the uh, formation, the shape of the mind, started to really become solid, and 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 forgetting the, all the beautiful things to a certain degree. I always knew, I always knew what I what I knew. I I held it in my heart, but the the major things, the most beautiful things started to fade away like I had a dream and I remember just about seven years ago flying somewhere and it was so beautiful Uh, actually that was the year that star star wars 7 came out and um we watching this movie uh on a flight great fantastic i love star wars so and we are right above the ground we are part of the movie great And there is this scene, um, this woman who was um, taking care of uh, Luke's saber and and the chest that the saber was in and a few other items. I don't know if you remember this very short woman with the big, big glasses that you see her pupils as if there was the whole eye. Okay, so at one point, yeah, oh, you remember that. So imagine she takes the glasses off at one point and I froze because I looked at the face of my mother. Mm. This was 
just absolutely stunning experience. And obviously the movie went on, but I, I kept being frozen in, in that space and, and starting to remembering those little people that used to come to see me and calling them parents and calling them siblings. And everything came alive to me again. Wow. So that must have been quite a transition then from age six to when this event occurred and did, did that coincide with a big life change for you or what happened at that point it's so interesting well you see in the last 20 years i i've been digging really deep mm -hmm. uh, with the help of a, of a teacher a shamanic teacher um amazing amazing person who helped me overcome um uh, psychosis and uh, and suicidal depression in some way some form um so my life for the last 20 years is a is a big excavation of of everything inside um to the point that i was able to look at uh, at pieces and items that um uh, normally I, I i would not be able to mm -hmm. So there was nothing particular as one event. It's a, it's a whole journey of last 20 years. Yeah. So at age 18, you decided to move to Canada and you said your sister was already there. Um, was that an act of getting away from the situation that, that you were in at home? Or was that just, I want to go join my sister? <laughs> a very good question. So actually, I left my family home when I was 14, and I was on my own since I was 14. So moving uh, moving to Canada was, was just another move, uh, and I was very fine with this. Uh, mind you, in, in uh, Poland was still very, very much communist regime, although the solidarity movement was happening, and um, who knew? Uh, at that point, we didn't know which way it will go. So mm. I um, I just packed everything I had, which was one little suitcase, and moved all the way to uh, to Canada. And that that was it, starting something new. But it was just, just like moving to another city, really, uh, with the exception that I did not speak the language the people spoke. Yeah, yeah. So you described that you went on sort of a 20-year journey to excavate and go through your own process of healing from depression, from suicidal thoughts. Um, what, what was it that brought you to the point of pursuing healing? You know, that's, that's such a big point for so many people that, that many people don't get there, right? And then you did, and then how, how did that unfold for you? you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Hmm. Mm, a very complex question. Um, well, looking back, suicidal was not on my radar, actually. It, it was never planned for me to commit suicide. So I'm thinking about my life as a um, stories and events that Magda needed to go through uh, to understand herself, to understand life, to arrive uh, later on in life at a place of compassion for humanity and mostly for herself. Um, I went through, and I share that with you the previous time, through two years of uh, very deep and, and uh, walking on the edge of suicide, um, two years of walking on the edge of suicide, and that would not happen. And and at that point, I, I just gave up. I gave up being suicidal. And I said, God, guide me. I don't know what to do anymore. And that actually changed my life. Maybe it was to to live um, live into live pain and, and suffering to the point where uh, I simply had enough. Mm. Mm. Wow. Well, that, that that's powerful. Um, I'm wondering... How did the background in Jehovah's Witness, did, is that something that you ever identified with? Or um, in going, you know, like you said, you, you asked God for help. Um, was that coming from the place of Jehovah's Witness? Or was that never, did that n never fit you? I'm just curious, because obviously you're not Jehovah's Witness now. Um, so, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm... I'm <laughs> 
just curious about how that did or did not play into, or just was it not even part of mm. your process? So, mm-hmm. so my father was was really a, a seeker of God. He spent literally his whole life seeking God and feeling that separation that he had to feel embodying that very particular archetype that he mm-hmm. did. And um, it, it was, I, I, I could write a book about the beauty now that I look back from much healed place. Um, I could write a book about true human suffering and and human hope and um, searching for God, for meaning. Um, it, it was abs- absolutely incredible now from my place today to to observe this. So we were Jehovah Witness for some time. I Magda was a little revolutionary herself. So mm. um, at the age of 12, I told my father that I'm going to church and he can think whatever he wants. And um, actually I gave him two weeks notice and that's exactly how I put it. And uh, he took it seriously. Two weeks later, he comes and says, okay, we all go to church. And that's how we how we started um, being Catholics. Uh, <clears throat> and again, in his mind, it was a search for God, search for freedom, search for community, and all those wonderful things. And really, honestly, what Magda wanted is friendship. There were kids I was not allowed to play with, with children at school. Mm-hmm. And you're absolutely right. Jehovah Witness was like maybe 0.5 or maybe 1% of of all population in Poland. Um, but I never identified myself with, with any religion. To me, there was God. There was something greater than I am. Um, I had mystical experiences since I was a child, and this was my norm. So calling someone God outside, um, it just did not fit the bill even when i was very very young i remember when i was 11 or 12 years old um for some reason a book by uh krishnamurti landed translated in polish landed in my in my family home and my eyes just went big because this was the only different book than bible on all the uh, pamphlets that we used to have Mm. for jehovah witnesses and all those things and i got so excited but to read this book i needed to get up at around 5 a.m uh so my parents were asleep because this was forbidden book so i read in secret that nobody could um really find out and i don't know how much i got out of this book at age 11 or 12 but it definitely somehow changed the trajectory of my life perhaps only in into looking that there is more than jehovah witness there is more than uh, bible christian bible and so on and so forth yeah well what a stark <laughs> contrast i can only imagine what that must have been like for you i mean it, i guess if i were to sum up jehovah's witness um sort of doctrine i, I guess it might be that god is coming so be strict and behave and then you're reading like Krishnamurti, which is basically God is within, so be love, you know? <laughs> I mean, what what a different message to then be receiving. And then even that transition into Catholicism about sort of opening up the community. I mean, the Jehovah's Witness community is just, it's so strict. And like you say, you can't play, you can't celebrate holidays, you can't participate in a lot of cultural activities. And so that no maybe... Birthdays. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's such a, a, a strict way of an, interpreting. And, and for me, I mean, it just feels very isolating from God, that yeah. sort of approach. Um, so I could see how Christian Murdy would be like potential like water in the desert. Definitely. Sunshine. Yes. Yeah. So then in pursuing <laughs> your, your own healing, um, I imagine that it kind of opened up again, back into your own sense of spirituality, your own sense of sort of living as a multidimensional person in striving for balance and health within that, you know, things that, that your family would have considered, well, it's just odd. She, you know, she talks to aliens, she has mystical experiences. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing like for Jehovah's Witnesses might be like, okay, devil's in here. Um, so how did you (laughs) reclaim that for yourself? How do I reclaimed who I am? Yes, yes. Yes? Huh, interesting. I 
I was treated a little bit like a golden child in childhood. Um, I could find water with um, with the dowsing instruments, and uh, people would call me a healer when I was just five, six years old, and and trying to get my hands over their heads, let's say, and heal their migraines and such. So there, there was um, I, I was growing. I realized with quite um, arrogance about who Magda is and and mm. my own abilities. Um, this this was instilled in me since I was literally a child so there were certain expectations of myself to uh, to also perform to be different to yes. um right and and that just uh, was not healthy at all um as i mentioned to you i have very strict teacher and um and she brought me back to earth and in, into uh, right humbleness. And, and I call it right humbleness because um, in Jehovah Witness, we were also very humbled as the, the uh, one uh, nation that is chosen by God. Oh, we are so humble. We thank you so much. Everyone else is going to hell, but we yes. are being saved, right? Yes. But so, so there are so many different meanings of humbleness. But um, so, so it was a journey for, for, for me to, to learn learn how to really be and, and lose my my spiritual ego that was very much inflated mm -hmm. um, so that was part of the question and I lost the other part <laughs> yeah so the, the sense of re reclaiming yourself as, as who you are but as you say, with sort of right humbleness, I mean, there's there's definitely there's self-inflationary humbleness, there's self-righteous humbleness. We see that a lot in religions, like we're right and we're so humble and everybody else is wrong. Um, we're the chosen ones. Um, this is the only way. And we're so humble about it that, I mean, that's it's the kind of thing that really turns me off. Um, just, just, oh, it just gets me going just thinking about it. But versus, you know, there's, um, you know, from the non-dual position, and this is something we, we talked about last time, is this idea of, look, we're all God. Yeah. And it's both empowering, but it's also humbling because we all are. I mean, there's, there's no one who is the one. There's no one that's that special one because we all are this same being in consciousness interacting with itself. And so there's a, both a humility to that there. And then there's also an empowerment that's there that we could say, Oh, well, I am that I am not separate. Um, and so in reclaiming, like for me, that was an important part of my process of, of accepting that reality of myself and kind of butting up against my own sense of what it meant to be humble or what it meant to be arrogant um, versus what does it mean to just kind of radically speak truth and be able to stand in that. So in, in reclaiming yourself and going through your own healing process that, um, I'm, uh, I'm losing my words at the moment, but in terms of how, how you emerged out of the depression, mm. emerged out of the darkness into mm. a more whole and healthy person. Mm -hmm. Beautiful question. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we going into the journey in, into the realm of 5-MeO DMT with this, uh, with this uh, question, obviously. But uh, I, I want to mention to you, sometimes as we go through healing, we really don't realize the changes until we look back and mm. say, Oh, last year I did this and that and that affected me this way and that way and I am not feeling it this way right now I'm not so we we kind of have to look back so I remember uh, actually this year my daughter who knows my story uh, pretty intimately asked me mom how did you let go of your past how did you shed your, your childhood mm. stories mm. and I looked at her as if she asked me something in different language and I had to really compute it in my head and I said did I really do that hmm. and then I realized yes yes I can talk uh, about my past I can express myself um, to a certain degree um, those stories don't affect me those stories don't live inside of me however 
what really changed um, my life and what got me out of the suicidal depression that lasted until I was 50 years old was um, an, one instance with 5-MeO-DMT where I put everything on one. Um, um, there is expression that I'm missing right now on one basket or I put everything it, in my in one basket. Yeah, okay. you, you put all your eggs in one basket or you did a, a Hail Mary. Okay, all right. I don't know the Hail Mary, so we stick with the basket. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, and I was, at that point, I was extremely des desperate. This was, again, I could feel the heaviness, the heavy weight coming back. And uh, <clears throat> the ideation was, was just living in me uh, profoundly. And uh, I met this facilitator who took on this challenge, and I'm very grateful for, for that experience. I opened up with, with everything uh, that I went through, that there is mental instability, that I'm dealing with suicidal depression for so many years. And what I can recall right now is the dosage that I, um, that I um, inhaled was very, very small. Very, very small, so small that now uh, I would think, did I take anything? Now that I know the dosage is a little, a little better. And, um, and that dosage was perfectly enough to, to show me something beyond this structure and, and this mind of mine that grew to be very powerful, obviously, uh, in, in self-destruction. And that, I love working with, I'm jumping ahead, I'm, I love working with small amounts of 5-ME or Bufo, um, but that is not it. I always say the this is not about the amount of the medicine, but amount of surrender that we offer ourselves. When I was so desperate and put everything in, in one basket, my life, my everything was there, and I said, let it be, they will be done, so to speak. Um, and I dove in, I completely surrendered. There was not even a thread of Magda resisting. And I said, if this is the way I will die, at least it's pleasurable. <laughs> I'm ready to go. And unfor unfortunately, fortunately, th this didn't happen. But what it left me with is, is pure wonder, pure wonder of, wow, wow, this is amazing. But what really changed um, is in the month following that experience, I realized I didn't have one single thought about suicide. And that was when I crossed the, the line into, into life and living. And I had no doubt at that point, I had no doubt that my struggles, my journey with suicide are over. And for the last three years, I haven't had, haven't had one instance. That's just so beautiful. So these, these, these dark thoughts of self-destruction were replaced by wonder. It sounds like. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wonder. Although in that wonder, I, I, I said, I know this. I know this. Yeah. Am I back to to something that I'm actually running away and 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 wants to find something different because I think this failed me because that was the feeling that I remembered in childhood. That was that wonder um, of being it, experiencing it myself as that energy. And it was golden. It was beautiful. I remember seeing myself as golden energy, and th this was um, th this was amazing experience that way. Yeah, and it, it's kind of reflective of that paradoxical nature of the experience that many people describe of when they do release and surrender into the five meo experience. It's both something novel and new, and it's also recognized as somehow I fundamentally know this or I always knew it yet somehow I forgot but even in my forgetting I still knew it so it's this you know in non-dual states one of the the characteristics of this idea of the resolution of opposites or just the, the balance of the paradoxical nature of being where that both things can be accepted as true at the same time and this is kind of one of those aspects of, of having forgotten something that you've always known yet you've always known, yet still forgotten. 
and and recognizing that. And I'm reminded in just a little bit, uh, a slight way with my own first full experience with 5-MeO, where it, for me, it, it wasn't a Hail Mary. It wasn't a put all my eggs in one basket, but it did come at a time in my life that I had just chosen to really radically change my life and I had let go of a lot of things and it was a very uncertain period for me. So I didn't, for me, it wasn't that I was trying to, you know, this wasn't like a last ditch effort to, okay, either give me, give me purpose and give me light or I'm done. But it was, here I am, I'm 35 years old, I've just completely given up my life and I don't know what's coming next. So yeah, if, if this is going to take me and I'm never coming back, fine. I'm ready. So for me, that was the primer that allowed me to fully surrender. And for you, it was, look, I've been living with these thoughts for so long and either this is going to change it or not. So here we go. And, and that's where I like to say that even though 5-MeO DMT is a very powerful molecule energetically, I also like to say, well, it is just a magic trick that in a way it doesn't really matter how much someone takes because it's just if they can pull that sleight of hand on themselves so that they do fully give up and surrender, it doesn't matter if it's two milligrams or if it's 20 milligrams, <laughs> really doesn't matter because you're ready in that moment to kind of pull the rug out from underneath yourself to have that experience. And that's, that's why it works, right? Because it, yes, it's yes. about, is the person ready, either through tragedy and suffering or through wherever they are in life, are they ready? And if they're ready, then the magic trick works. And if they're not mm -hmm. ready, well, then there's resistance or, you know, we'll get something else. Then the medicine becomes the truth serum and they know exactly uh, what stops them. And it's wonderful that way I also. So there's, I, 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 I say this medicine never does anybody wrong. It, you always will come up with such knowledge about yourself. Um, it's just wonderful that way. Yeah. And so in going to 5-MeO, um, had you had prior psychedelic experience to that? Or was this just, I've heard about this and... I'm ready to say either give it to me or fuck it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. is, is that where you were at? Or was this, did, had you researched this? Had you looked into this? You decided, how did that decision come about for you? Mm. I, I, I had a feeling that my time came to an end and um, I wanted to make sure that I turn every single stone that presented to me mm. itself uh, before checking out. So I didn't do too much research. I didn't Google. Uh, it was said, well, this is what I do. Would you like to try? And I simply said, yes, when, when, when can I, when can I have the appointment? I didn't have any prior psychedelic experiences. In fact, I was very much against this was something that bad people do. And this is doing drugs and, and all those things. Although I had prescription for uh, insomnia um, and um, physical body pain um, uh, from medical doctor for cannabis and uh, that even took me a long time before I I, I started taking it the way uh, it worked um, and, and it took the pain away and, and helped me sleep four hours which I was over the moon like four hours sleep for Magda was was just amazing so no prior experiencing at all and I think going uh, so to speak cold turkey into five experience um, was really good for me, <laughs> really good. I would not want it any other way. I w probably would be scared having prior experiences, to be honest. Yeah. Well, this brings us to um, sort of an interesting question, and this is something that's coming up, you know, as I'm going through and editing this book about facilitating 5-MeO and from all these different facilitators. And there are definitely there are some people who are, are of the opinion where they say, I think it's best that people work up to 5-MeO DMT, that that not be their first psychedelic experience. And um, this was not <clears throat> how you were introduced to 5-MeO DMT. And in the time that I was facilitating, um, I would say uh, it probably maybe at least a third of the people that I facilitated for had zero 
prior psychedelic experience at all. And even that I did find with people who did have prior psychedelic experience, but not 5-MeO-DMT, that often those were the ones who thought they knew what they were getting into because they had prior psychedelic experience and learned within about two seconds that they didn't have a clue. So now, so we're kind of skipping ahead, but now as a facilitator yourself, um, what would be your position on this this issue of work your way up to 5-MeO-DMT or it's okay to start there? You know, Martin, what a great question. And I hear it all the time. And sometimes people are, other facilitators are calling me and saying, oh, I have this person, uh, um, they say they're ready for five, but I don't think they are ready. They need to work their way up. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, this is not how I look at it. Uh, th there are two things. Um, and the most important, I think, is the readiness of the facilitator mm. to take on someone that doesn't have any prior experiences. I am very new in facilitating. This is a year, actually, that I'm working with others and three years that I'm working with myself, with Bufo and 5MEO. So I have very little experience. Yet what really helped me um, working with people is, is really my background. Um, I practice Chinese medicine and I have been prescribing medicinals for last 10 years and uh, working very intimately with with, with patients and and that gave me that comfort of um, sitting with someone for the first time I actually love working with someone who never had any other experience psychedelic experience they are fresh they are open they have no preconceived ideas of how it could be should be uh, or what they want out of it they just fresh uh, just take me I, I want to experience this. It's beautiful, that naivete, um, surrender, openness, whatever we want to call it, all of the above, is just the right combination for someone to have really amazing 5MU experience, This, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and it worked that way for you. So we kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but let's go back now into... After that first experience, um, you started working with it more. And um, I know we talked last time about how you went and sat with a number of different facilitators and exploring. So I was wondering if you could tell us uh, about that process. So you had your first experience brand new to the psychedelic experience in general. And I know that you, you have enriched your palate by this point. And maybe we didn't really talk about that last time. So maybe we could talk about that this time as well. But then that gave you a month of grace, which is um, also something that we've discussed is, is very common with 5-MeO that like a month is a pretty standard time period where afterwards people just feel like, wow, I, I'm just walking on air. There's, because that sense of perfection that we've experienced, it really lands in the body. And the thought patterns change. People are more present. You know, it's going back to the, the child walking down the street. and Oh, look at the flower and look at the trees. And oh my God, it's yes. so beautiful. And I'm here and I get to be in a body. And this is, this is so fantastic that I'm, I'm infinite, but I'm here. And then all the wonderful things that are here in reality with me. I mean, it's, just, it's this rebirth. It's such a beautiful thing that happens. Uh, but then often after a month, for some people, they're able to hold on to that. But for others, the old structures come back, the old habits come back, because for most people, these things don't unwind from just one experience. Right? It's an ongoing process of going deeper, releasing more, encountering other aspects of yourself. So how did that proceed for you after you realized uh, it's been a month, I haven't thought of killing myself even once. What's going on here? What was the next step for Magda? Oh, Magda is an explorer and seeker. So I needed to find uh, where I can have more experiences and, and go deeper, go as deep as I possibly could. <clears throat> I wasn't sure whether this, um, this state of mind will 
disappear and my old thoughts of suicide will come back, I wanted to uh, harness the opportunity that I had right at that moment and go as deep as I could. And that's exactly what I did. Um, it was COVID. It was um, uh, borders were closed and so on and so forth. But I managed to fly to States uh, to take a week course um, with Buffo and other psychedelics. And I simply became a psychonaut for uh, about a year. I had many, 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 many experiences, both with 5MEO and every other psychedelic on the planet. I really wanted to um, understand my inner landscape. I want to know how I respond to every different psychedelic, uh, what what it takes, what is the journey which with each one. And it was really beautiful because each psychedelic substance brought me to experiencing different part of myself, so mm -hmm. to speak. And yet overall the same part um, that is Magda. <clears throat> So the learning and the combination was really spectacular. I went through something like a 20 or 30 um, deep dives with all kinds of psychedelic. Half of this was 5-MeO or Buffo either. But um, within a very short period of time, about a year, year and a half. So it, it was really digging deep and, and diving deep. Um, and that actually was necessary in my case. I would perhaps not uh, recommend this to anybody else, um, but it was my way of becoming who I am today. It was absolutely necessary. Yeah, and I think that that's important to point out that um, this kind of deep intensive study, it's kind of like going to the ultimate graduate school in a sense, is not necessarily for everyone at whatever point they are in their life, but kind of similar to your own story. Again, for me, after that first 5-MeO experience, you know, I had had prior psychedelic experiences. I'd been working with mushrooms and salvia divinorum for, you know, a number of years before my first 5-MeO experience. But that started something that was like, I am diving all the way in now in a way that I never have before. And then the next year and a quarter, it was intensive work. Lots of 5-MeO you know, once once every month or every two months, lots of ayahuasca, mushrooms, salvia divinorum. So probably every two weeks or so for that year and a quarter, I was doing some kind of psychedelic work. And what I found for me is each experience was building on the last one. It was it wasn't like oh well, there was that ayahuasca thing and that happened, and then there was that five meo thing and that that happened, and they're unrelated. No, each one was building, and it was it was cumulative, and it. So that period was extremely formative for me, but it's, it's not what I do now because there's no need for that. But at the time, that was the restructuring. That was the energetic recalibration. And it sounds like you went through something similar by really giving yourself that opportunity to explore and dive in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was beautiful. And yes, from what you're saying, you have pretty much the same journey. And at that point, facilitation kind of blew at the, in the back of my mind, but it was really doing work for myself, um, finding out who this being Magda is, how to be human um, and, and God at the same time. And it is okay to combine the two somehow and, <laughs> until I really got it. So yes, it, it was beautiful, beautiful journey. And I had the privilege and opportunity to work with eight different facilitators observing their work, um, either as recipient or sitting in a circle or being a part of the training, which was really fantastic because I realized, well, I cannot be Martin, I cannot be Joe, I cannot be Karen, I have to be Magda. Mm -hmm. I need to find who is Magda as potential facilitator. And it took me a while to really sit comfortably with um, everything that I was born with and, and bring it to the surface as facilitator. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a very unique journey. Yeah. It's beautiful that you took the time <laughs> to explore all of this and to sit with all these different facilitators because it's another common thing with 5-MEO where people have their first experience and then because it can be so beautiful and so overwhelming and just so life transforming that many people are like, 
I want to start serving this to people right away, right? That I, I want to share this experience. So there's a strong pull on a lot of people, but it sounds like you kind of did your due diligence of working on yourself and exploring and really learning yourself through that time period. Now, I wanted to ask you to share again um, a story that uh, you talked about last time, and I'm not sure where this came in your experience in, in my recall of our previous conversation, but you had described the golden light and the spirit of Bufo and this, and, <laughs> and I think that's probably what you were referencing earlier, but um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us again about that experience and where that fit in this time period of exploration. <clears throat> Right, right. Oh, it, it, it was absolutely beautiful experience. You, you, you write and you remember that. Um, <clears throat> that was where I really asked myself the question, do I want to step into facilitation? Mm -hmm. Is this for me or is it my ego calling it? Because it is grant medicine. Everybody is like, oh, euphoric afterwards. And uh, right. So I, Am I looking with the right lens of eyes at, at this opportunity? Is it calling me or am I calling it? So um, I sat with, with in a circle with facilitator and uh, I was very shy to ask that question actually, um, but I did anyways. And uh, it, it was amazing, amazing journey to the, uh, the whole journey. Uh, it was very heavy dose, actually. And uh, I remember um, feeling the medicine in my body, feeling it um, hitting my head very strongly. And to the point that I, my spirit moved out of my body. And what I saw, I, I looked at my head and I saw all the electrical electric network of central nervous system being lit beautifully and i and i said oh, that's amazing mm -hmm. as as i'm having this thought of admiration how this medicine works and actually that i can see it how it unfolds in in, in the brain uh, i was sucked into my body and catapulted it out of my body into uh, into a place where uh, was amazing everything was made out of golden energy and there were mountains on the horizon and I said oh this is absolutely beautiful I looked up and there was this swirl of beautiful golden energy and I knew that was love and I knew oh my god it's not touching that we're not melting today uh, let's stay where we are <laughs> My ego said, "No, let's let's stay. We are saving here." And uh, as I as I looked, there was um, there was beautiful um, family um, people. Um, they introduced themselves as ancestors. And this this very humbling and overwhelming sense of peace and gratitude. And am I really seeing this? Am I really invited to uh, to experience this? This is this is just beautiful. And I looked to my to my left. There was this young man standing next to me, and and I recognized immediately. And I said, "Buffo, that's that's you." And he was dressed in ceremonial outfit with beautiful crown made of uh, diamonds. And I looked at myself, and I had the same outfit. And I said, "Either the, the, my I didn't say anything. I just felt so much at that moment, and I had no idea what all those feelings were. My my mind could not." Uh, compute what was happening inside of me I just simply returned back and um, shared a little bit with the facilitator and she says oh that's big mm -hmm. but for me it was I have no idea if this is big or this is small let's wait and see yeah and I sat with with that experience for a really really long time um, until I saw spirit of Buffo sitting in in front of me on my couch one day when I had phone call conversation with my teacher and I said oh Buffo is sitting in front of me what does it mean and in that moment Martin what came to me when I saw Buffo uh, spirit um, in human form of course uh, in, in my vision during five, during Bufo experience, he was looking at, at the family, he was looking at the ancestors, and I was sure, mm -mm, he's not coming with me, this is not for me. Mm. But a few months or even a year later, when he sat in front of me on the sofa, 
and he told me in a brief second he told me story i was just saying goodbye to my family because i was coming with you mm. beautiful <laughs> so, absolutely beautiful very humbling and and um you know the saying that spider-man said or his grandfather with great power comes great responsibility is a very scary place to be and live yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i i i get that um the feeling of can can i live up to the responsibility yet also that the temptation to tap into that power because it is powerful and to embody that yourself. And there's just so many elements of this um, recounting that are just so fascinating, just kind of from the phenomenological perspective of how you describe it as early in the experience that you kind of had a disembodied perspective on yourself. So you're, you are literally detached and then looking back at yourself. But in order for this experience to unfold, you had to go back into the body and then from there emerge out, not as a detached consciousness, right? Which I think is, it kind of illustrates something that could be a, a very important phenomenological distinction in psychological experiences that some people become detached and wander off and get lost versus like I, I have this saying where I say, look, there's infinite number of directions you can go out, but there's only one way in. There's only one way to the center. You have to go in. And so then you're your awareness is drawn into your body and then that's what allows it to open up and unfold. And then in seeing this spirit of Bufo in this kind of this story scene of the ancestors, but then looking at the spirit and seeing how it is dressed and then looking at yourself and realizing that it's the same, you know, kind of just very, um, very palpably demonstrating the mirrored nature of reality that what we experience is ourselves, that it's all a mirror in some sense. And, and it even reminds me when I was a graduate student, um, writing about, uh, for my master's dissertation, I was, I was focusing on Lakota visionary experiences of the, um, indigenous cultures of the great plains. And something that stood out to me that nobody writing about Lakota visionary experiences had ever really focused on, but, in story after story that I was reading of these Lakotas going on vision quests and then seeing a spirit. And usually it's kind of, it's very similar to what you describe where they would say, well, it was the spirit of the elk or the spirit of the bison or the spirit of the eagle, but it was a person, right? It wasn't the animal. It was a person. But then so many of these stories, they also say, and the person looked just like me or was dressed just like me. And it just, it struck me that in all the people who are writing about Lakota culture and sharing these visionary stories that no one ever really focused in on that. I just like, well, well, this is fascinating. Like, why is that? And that's part of my own budding sort of non-duality of this, this idea that actually we're only just experiencing ourselves in different guises and different forms. And this sort of reveals that, that the spirit of the animal is me. I am that, so we're not actually separate, but we're interacting through these separate guises in order to progress along in our journey of self-understanding and uh, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then in deciding to facilitate, I, I, this is something that I think is very, very interesting about you um, because I know that you mostly work with what I like to call the pure molecule, which some people on, on the toad side of the fence, they refer to as synthetic man-made garbage. That it's, it's not the real thing because it doesn't have the spirit of the toad in it. And so there's a lot of dismissiveness there. Um, whereas I've always felt the synthetic is perfectly fine. 5-MeO-DMT is 5-MeO-DMT. I don't really care where it comes from. It's the same molecule. Um, but my point is to ask you about the idea of you are working with the spirit of Bufo, but I know that you mostly serve the pure molecule. So talk to us a little bit uh, about that and um, also how you developed your own facilitation. So there's lots of aspects to that. So I'll return to some parts of the question, but mm -hmm. let's just start with the working with the spirit of Bufo, but actually using the pure molecule. Sure. 
Um, working with spirits, as I mentioned last time we spoke, it, it, it is my language. It is my way of communication. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other. So this is why I, I see things. I hear things. I perceive things, spirits and such. So this is my norm. Other people have their own guiding tools and such. Uh, so spirit of Buffo, which is me. Uh, um, let's let's say it as it is. There, there is no secret. This is really developing a relationship with myself, mm -hmm. with that self that uh, I brought. You see, the the subconscious mind uh, has not only the wounded self and the dark self, has also the golden self and the beauty self yes. and the magical self and all that we we yet to discover. And I was able in that vision that I had that I shared, I was able to tap into that realm of beauty that lives inside of me where Buffo lives, where Ancestor lives, and, and Buffo is part of me. When people ask me to, I'm jumping ahead right now, p people asking me to teach them how to facilitate when once they observe me, said, oh, this is, this is what I would love to do. I cannot teach them how to be themselves. Yeah. But I can, <laughs> I can guide them how to develop that relationship, but they need to know how to be themselves and how to tap into those resources and energies. Um, and I forgot your question again. Can you okay. remind me? Yeah. Um, uh, but first, I just want to just touch on that last point that you just made. And I think that that is so important. And so I just want to emphasize it, that when people see other people facilitating psychedelic medicines, whether it be toad or 5-MeO or ayahuasca or anything else, and there can be this idea of, oh, I see what you're doing. I want to do what you're doing. But I like that what you come back with is, well, look, I can help you find yourself in your own way. But there's, in the psychedelic world, there's a lot of what I refer to as parroting. And this actually takes place within religion and spirituality in general. Is there's a lot of parroting. My, my teacher said this, so I said this. The tradition does this, so I do this. But there's a difference when you are exploring your own style your your own method your your own expression of yourself and that for me is is the ultimate teacher it's like no don't try and be like this person or that person don't shake a rattle because this person does find what actually works for you and within that there ultimately is not a right or a wrong because we're all different people so if someone comes and says well i want to be magda that's Sorry, the wrong approach. That's already taken. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, you've got, you've got to be you. Yeah. Magda's already taken. So find your own way. And it's beautiful that you went to all these different teachers, went to all these different facilitators, but still kept your own integrity as yourself, that I'm going to do it yes. my way. Yeah. Yes. I, I tried. I tried to be someone else and it just didn't work. It didn't work at all. Um and that's how it is with, with I guess, every medicine. Uh, we need to find who we truly are and our relationship with, with that particular medicine. And you asked a question about uh, working with 5-MeO, the, the molecule, yes. but working also yes. with uh, with the spirit. <laughs> yes. Um, Buffo doesn't mind being used. Um, the organic substance is here for us, for humans. But as he told me, um, humans are developing uh, sensitivities and allergies. So this goes both ways. If we want to preserve uh, the toad, good for us. But toad wants to preserve humans as well. So this is a very, very pure and very dual relationship. So the, the only thing that Buffo asked me is to call him and be aware that he's around when um, working with the pure molecule. And there is absolutely no difference. Um, the result is the same. And because it is my language, as I said, of communication, I cannot imagine uh, this being any other way, uh, working with 5-MeO and not calling the spirit in. So it was just given that this, this is the way, this is the path. Yeah. And it sounds like that is your access back into that space of the golden light of pure love. Yes. 
Absolutely, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so for somebody else to try and do that, it's like, that's not your experience, right? That's my, that was Magda's experience. So that's the foundation of how she practices. So then in making that decision that you were going to share it with others, um, this, so this will bring us into how you've developed your practice. And if you could tell us a little bit about, well, what does it mean to sit with somebody for you with 5-MEO and to serve them? And then we can get into how you became associated with the Samadhi Center. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when, and, and if we can go through the steps, because um, this is also like part of the book project. And so this is quite, it's always an interesting question of, well, when someone says, Magda, I'd like to do this. What are the steps? And then how does it actually proceed when you're, when you're directly working with someone in the medicine space? Hmm. So, so you, you basically want to know the steps as intake and, and yeah. interview into, into the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, this is the most time consuming aspect of being a, f a facilitator, actually, uh, the preps. Mm -hmm. Um, and also post-medicine uh, integration. Um, so, so sitting with someone is a breeze comparing to, so to speak, yeah. uh, comparing to, to other things that uh, I, I personally feel very much responsible for. For me, this is not, oh, someone is coming to sit with me, great, where is the next person? Uh, I'm ready. Um, th this is my dedication. I, I, my personal journey taught me a lot about... Um, um, receiving and about giving and uh, when people are ready um, the, there is when I decide to sit with someone I don't want to cut corners this is this is way too important to me and I want to use the word sacred although this is way overused word so uh, it's very important that I will I will do all my due diligence work um, in every step so the intake is uh, um, interview over Zoom interview with uh, with potential uh, candidate to uh, for five meo. Um, I don't sign any legal documents. Actually, I was advised by a lawyer not to because once you have legal documents signed, this is this is legal document that you're doing something that potentially is wrong uh, yeah. to start with. So why do you have those legal documents signed? So I said, mm, wait a minute. Although in Canada, a 5MU is not scheduled. Uh, so there, there is a way of, of working uh, with this molecule with integrity, um, politically um, uh, correct. Um, integrity. So um, I sent a list of things that uh, the preparation work that needs to take place are listed uh, with a long list of SSRIs. I realized that just naming how uh, there are medications that uh, should be avoided and are contraindicated, example, SSRIs, I realized people are not really familiar with, with what it means. So I have a whole list, like 30, 40, and, and new ones are coming. So I'm trying to keep it updated. Um, and I list all of them that are contraindicated. I had instance when someone looked at the list and said, oh, I'm good. I have only two out of the 30, so I, I can go. I said, no, you can't. You can't even have one. So there is a lot of education involved in, and holding hands and walking with, with the people um, along. And if I say no to someone, which does happen, my heart breaks. And it, especially if this is for uh, medical reasons, they have to stop taking the meds and and this is uh, really a process they need to go through and look with um into with a doctor and so on and so forth um my heart really breaks but i uh, there, there's no way i would be taking chances for uh, for someone's life um and also my heart breaks because i know how it how it feels to be desperate for a change mm, yeah. um, and when you realize that western meds did what they could do and and now you're ready for something new but you are limited to your resources and then you hear about 5-MEO yes it is sweeping the globe uh, in a big wave uh, and everybody's talking about 5-MEO but there are people that are looking for solutions and these are the people that I love to work with and I don't mind holding 
holding hands and and so to speak babysitting them step by step mm -hmm. and sometimes even finding uh, finding solutions is not my uh, ever recommendation what to do with uh, western meds um, but at least guiding them to let's you can talk with your doctor and see so this is the most uh, time-consuming step, and then uh, then I will invite them over to to sit with me, and uh, I like to start gently. And starting gently means two things: um, either starting with small dose of uh, medicine, or starting with a little stronger dose of medicine, and and seeing you see the personality. I I, I feel. I feel where the resistance is very often before the, they take medicine uh, or, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And, and oh, no, but that's okay. Let's the medicine show you what is happening. Um, uh, so the first take will be that, that of more diagnostic way mm -hmm. uh, where they are. And also to show them how powerful, strong the medicine is, how quickly the truth is coming out. Uh, someone that was super excited i was looking for this for so long i'm finally here i can't believe i am so honored and you know they are they genuinely are until they take the first uh, path and they yeah. say holy fuck yeah, what is yeah. that oh 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 i think uh, i'm resisting oh i think this is too much oh are you here right so so this can be a little traumatizing so i am there with them all the way um, sometimes even when they, when they fall unconscious, I know they hear me and I, I will speak only what is necessary with minimal amount of words, uh, giving them some directions, um, surrender, you are love, uh, you are safe. It's okay to die today. You yeah. will live after this. You know, just something. But it also takes knowing that person. So in the interview that I have with them, I want to feel them. I want to talk about the everyday thing in not only the five of you, but tell me a little bit about yourself. What mm -hmm. brings you in? How are your children? What do you do for a living? Just having conver casual conversation. I'm really interested. And there always will be something they share with me that will stick with me as a reminder later on I remind I will remind them do you remember you told me this and that and it's like oh coming back to senses coming back to presence and surrendering even deeper so those conversations that we have beforehand are extremely in my opinion extremely important mm -hmm. and it sounds like you give people the opportunity to have more than one hit of the medicine in the course of a session Yes, and and really, I, I don't have any schedule. I don't have any um, uh, agenda. How that should go? How many hits they they will get? Uh, we go with the flow, and if they feel like having another one, yes. If they, and sometimes, um, sometimes they. I will say, you know, it will be really good for you to have that one more mm. hit, and the their big uh, the eyes will get big and said really good thing so and i feel i feel the trepidation i feel the the anticipation but i also feel the surrender and i will match with my whole being that surrender that they have inside because we are one and i know they can feel me much better right now uh, when they have the medicine in their system so i will just go into full surrender there is there is no agenda they nothing inside magda except surrender and if you want to go we are ready and let's do it and and that's that's how it is every session is different every person is different and th there is no schedule for what I do how I do mm -hmm. and sometimes I, I work in a shamanic way I, I'm I am trained shaman so um, I see some energy shifting and moving in their chest or their belly so I just simply scoop it sometimes it's a being um, part of their psyche um, and in in my language it, it it will present itself to me as a being so i scoop it out and the minute they are removed from the person they simply dissolve into nothingness because they cannot exist even in 3d there is too much light for them or too much of vibration for for those beings of very low frequencies yeah well it really sounds like a practice of 
really genuinely and authentically being present with the people that you're working with and the embodiment within yourself of presence of surrender of trust that that is what allows for this intimate level of work to take place and and this is also a place where you know i like to commend people who practice that way because i i do see a lot in the 5meo world and you know in other medicine circles as well where the person running the show the provider is distracted and doing other things or interacting with other people versus there's a sense of presence of calm authoritative presence of just being with one person and being with them through every phase of that experience and and for me like you know i've written about and talked about that for me that's the difference between a provider a provider is just someone who provides the experience provides the medicine and says okay have a great time versus a practitioner is someone who is there to work with the person and to take that time and to take that devotion and focus and as you say that it's the breezy part because it's it's actually fun to do that and it's exciting and beautiful because we 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 feel the transformation taking place when you have that presence and so it's a joy but it's also it's work and it's to have that presence is just so important and so it's just beautiful to to hear how you describe that for yourself and then how you work with that and work with individuals and how each Mm. person is different and that's you know even when we're dealing with these medicines you know every person's experience is still different and it's, absolutely yeah, absolutely and we need to meet them where they are with the full spectrum of psychology and and, and everything else and and day-to-day life as they come to see us yeah yeah i think it's really important to know what it means to be a human being to do this kind of work because we we are these multifaceted beings and we do have we have family life we have relationships we have draw jobs we have our self-image we have perhaps self-loathing we have their inner judge and critic and we have our relationship to god and relationship to reality and and all of it that it we are complex beings it's not there's never a one-size-fits-all approach um Mm -hmm. so then how did you become connected with the samadhi institute how did that relationship develop and how did you get invited in there or or did you invite yourself or you know I, we didn't really we didn't really get into the details in our last conversation so I'm curious yes. mm-hmm, that's true we we didn't talk about it at, at all actually uh, <clears throat> you know there is never plan for those things um Dan and I Dan Schmidt and and I met at an event that someone else held and um just as we were introducing ourselves I think Dan mentioned oh I'm I'm running this pilot project on um meditation with with Iboga and I said oh that's interesting I would love to participate mm. and that that was it and and then as we exchanged few um few a uh, few things I said, would you think 5MEO would fit? Um, I so see 5MEO being part of the whole experience. And then said, whoa, that, that really resonates with me. So mm. basically, that's it. That That's the whole story behind this, uh, in my opinion, really revolutionary and beautiful and much needed way of experiencing meditation. And um, it, it's not really about meditation. It's not really about Iboga and it's not about 5MEO. It's about the combination that allows us to experience something that is beyond this human structure, this, this uh, avatar that we are. And for some people, even... Um, long-time meditators uh, having experienced this full experience with Iboga and uh, and 5MEO brings brings them to a new realm of understanding meditation and understanding themselves. I cannot speak enough about 
how wonderful those two medicines are in this regard, in 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 a way of meditation, where one is, is allowing us to to feel grounded, and there is timelessness with iboga. You literally lose the sense of time. You lose the sense of um, sitting on cushion and being uncomfortable. All this disappears. So I could very easily meditate for two three hours, and I was absolutely astonished. It's like, whoa, this is possible for novice like me. I never mm. meditated before. Before, and here I am doing it for extended period of time and then at the end is the 5MU experience and uh, I remember in one of the retreats someone said so why exactly did we meditate for 10 years uh, 10 days since we have 5MU experience and poof there it is right so this was really beautiful and people are getting it people get the the value of 5MU and the whole experience and I absolutely love working in groups I love working. It is very intimidating for me. Let's let's not take mm. it that easily because I am there exposed with with one by one coming to sit with me and and we work through everything. So it is it can be intimidating. But Martin, once I am in that in that environment of five MEO, there there is no time for me. I am not Magda anymore. And what is happening? And you, I know you understand uh, the, this this scenario. But it's it's bigger than anything that we can really explain to people how it feels and what it is. There are no words to it. How do I know what dose each person needs or? Um, it, it needs to be given. I don't know, but there is this intelligence, and I call it buffo, um, that is inside of me. So my only, only expectations in the whole game of being provider or facilitator or supporting people is that Magda will step away and give room to something that she may not even understand, and that's okay. Full trust, full trust, and full surrender to that power. And and miracles happen, magic happens. I work at the Samadhi Center when I work, is, is about seven, eight people, and we have about five hours. So this is not a long time to allow every participant to have their full experience. So there is, in a way, a lack of time to allow them to unfold and, and feel it fully, but <clears throat> there's also beauty to it. So when I know they are coming back, I, I sense that they're starting to uh, feel their body, I will offer them to uh, to sit up. Samadhi Center has beautiful windows mm. and, and there is nature outside and nothing more potent than feeling that surrender and oneness with nature because for many people it's rather difficult to feel oneness with other people but nature offers us um, animals, nature offers us that feeling that we belong, we are one. So I sit them up and I will ask them just to look outside and ah, that's the moment when not only I but everyone in the room can see what is happening inside this this human being and that is indescribable the softness the gentleness the light that is pouring through their eyes and their face in this pure amazement of being part of this universe is absolutely priceless and, and I would very often invite them to sit and, and watch the group also mm. turn around and look at everyone individually and some of them will feel that oneness with everyone um, uh, and some don't and that's okay this is part of the whole journey part of the experience and self-discovery I also give them a little sip of water water anything that is earthy and bringing them back and and bringing them back into the body the water tastes fantastic after five meo and it's like oh right i'm back the ego says i survived it's yeah. amazing give me some water <laughs> so so we do that and then i will sit them uh, um uh, gently uh with their back supported so they can look observe and and go through the rest of, of the process because it's not done and i have full awareness that they are not done yet so it will take them another 20 30 minutes perhaps uh but this is all part of the whole experience um we are out of time outside rather of time and space and and uh, 
uh, everyone's journey is my journey as well. So the person that just had journey observes someone else's journey when it's open, when it's perceiving, when the senses are so on uh, um, available to feel and 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 be more than just observer, but be part of the journey. Um, so so we have many journeys. I always tell them, your journey is my journey. So be ready to receive other people's journey and healing as your own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like probably the the ten days of meditation with the yoga helps prime people to really be present in that experience. And it is one of the interesting aspects of facilitating psychedelic medicines in a group context is that one of the things that I always encourage among people who are in that kind of context is I would always say, well, really feel into everybody else's experience, you know, even as you're just sitting and observing. And if you really pay attention, you will find that even if whatever that person is going through is very different than what your experience was, you will still be able to recognize yourself in that experience. And so there's this really rich learning opportunity as the the, the narrow borders of the ego are softened that we realize, oh, well, I had a beautiful, you know, kind of cosmic orgasm and this person is freaking out and screaming, but I can see what I can see that I can feel that and I could recognize those tendencies within myself because we're all reflections of each other. And so that's, that's part of what's special about doing group work. But for myself, I always wanted just to do one-on-one with people, but I do think that there is value in that and getting, getting to see, and, and that's a, a, a different way of learning about the self by going on these sort of group journeys and experiences. Um, I'm curious if you find that with people who have gone through the 10 day meditation with Iboga, do they seem primed for their 5-MeO experience in a different way than people who are coming in for individual work? Um, Do do you feel there's something different there? Or um, is it still, we never really know what we're going to get with each person. It's always always different and still seeing a wide variety of uh, reactions and responses. Mm. Mm, Very good question, Martin. So, um, I work with very specific um, type of people. Uh, when someone calls me from a street and, and wants to come and sit with me, and most likely it will be a no. Um, and, and this is with full respect for, for their journey. It's just I am not that type of facilitator. Um, um, it may sound really bad what I said right now, but it is true. I'm, I, I am selective in, in who I invite into my space. Um, so people that come to Samadhi Center are also of certain, uh, I don't want to use the word quality, but it's the one that is coming coming in my limited uh, vocabulary now. Um, so there, there is quality of people that comes to Samadhi Center and people that are seekers, people that have um, um, years of meditation uh, practice or um, are on a crossroads and and did some inner work and, and looking to go deeper. So these are not, as Dan would call it them, not spiritual tourists. Mm-hmm. And and that's very fitting. So after 10 days of meditation, everything is so open up and, and so right on the surface. And uh, very little medicine will go a really long way uh, for, for them. So this is that difference that I have noticed that there is this full preparation. When I tell people that um, it's good uh, if they um, take seven days to prepare mentally, um, lower down, um, use of um, electronics and so on and change a little bit of diet and three days is that I really ask people to um, um, be responsible for their for what they put in and both men for, for their minds and then for their bodies um, and when I get questioned but why that's a red flag for me. Mm. So, uh, so people that come to uh, to Samadhi uh, actually um, go through more than I ever ask people to to sit with themselves and prepare. So work is much easier. Um, there are some challenging and difficult cases, of course, but I have never met anybody that would say that was wrong for me, mm. or I was not ready for this. 
uh, it, it is with great um, humility that people accept their journey um, as they as it unfolded for them. And either this is beautiful, uh, reaching samadhi and reaching non-dual experience and and uh, bliss, uh, cosmic orgasm, or this is oh I, now I know what I what I have inside. Yeah. I need to work on is amazing. Uh, one of the things that someone said after a sitting with five is, <clears throat> now I know how much surrender I need to offer myself in meditation to reach that state mm. that I reached with five MEO. What an amazing insight that is. And, and this is just just a guiding tool. 5MEO is, is not the liberation itself. It's a tool allowing us uh, to go through the libera liberation if we choose so. But it's also showing us where our limitations are, where our beliefs are, where we believe that we are enough being small. And, and I like to say that we tend to think we are the obstacle when we feel it. How about we change that perspective and feel we are the, the, the five MEO experience itself because this is who we truly are. Yeah. It's just flipping the consciousness, flipping the awareness and looking at ourselves as the amazing, unlimited, um, infinite being of, of light and love that we truly are. So this is all that people are experiencing in in the five MEO experience uh, in in Samadhi Center. Mm. Yeah, well, it sounds nice that for you, that you kind of get people who have been pre-screened, and obviously people who are there who are committing to a ten day meditating retreat, they're dedicated. They, yes. they want this, and I also love that. I think you'll probably agree with this that it sounds like these are the responses that you're getting, and this is. You know, like sometimes with people who are meditators, they say, oh, well, I don't need something like 5-MeO DMT. I'm really good at meditation. But what I have found is that you take <laughs> even the most experienced meditator and then they yes. get their 5-MeO experience and they're like, oh, that's the potential. I didn't, I had no idea that was the potential. And so that it really does enrich the life of a meditator. Absolutely, 100%. It's... I can't say enough. I'm I'm so in love with with doing the work I'm doing, Martin. I I, I think you can see and hear from yeah. from my expressions that this is a game changer for for humanity. I'm forever grateful for for this opportunity, as I am for all my life that uh, brought me to this point of really sitting in 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 that humbling place of. Um, provider, facilitator, I, I, I don't know the name, but uh, yes, offering to work with people. I'm really amazed with every time I sit with people, what, what comes out. Yeah, well, that, that's beautiful. And I know you've been um, doing some, some other explorations, I think, deeper into Iboga. So just to kind of wrap up our conversation, um, I'm just curious where you feel you're going next in your own personal path, in your own enrichment. Um, if you want to share anything about that, and then I'll let you go for today. So, so yes, I am leaving for Africa in a couple of days. And yes, I'm going to uh, to spend some time with witty people. Um, um, Iboria invited me to do so, and um, I just simply said yes to it. Um, it. It is a beautiful medicine. It is very humbling medicine. It is a medicine where I really saw myself when I had flat dose. I really saw the whole truth, um, the ugliness of, of the whole thing, of, of the human mind, uh, what, what we came. I, I, I will take back uh, the word ugliness, um, the complexity. Yeah. and uh, beauty of of who we truly are there are some aspects that really took me by surprise um my journeys with bufo with five mio are always uplifting uh, yet not easy um uh, but nothing comparing to what i have seen and what i have experienced with iboga and having that personal experience as you know i'm working with the spirits and if the spirit shows up and says magda you're going okay uh, i just requested a ticket 
certificate and it showed up on my um, on my uh, lap. So uh, there we go. I, I am uh, in investigating, so to speak, this uh, type of healing for myself. I am not thinking about being provider, um, but I didn't say yes to Buffo either, so we don't know. <laughs> well, great. Well, I look forward to hearing uh, more <laughs> on the return trip, but uh, just Magda, I just want to let you know that I really appreciate you making time for me again here on the podcast, and I appreciate our relationship and connection and enjoy uh, getting the opportunity to speak with you and um, just love hearing about your own life, your struggles, your your own growth, and what you're able to bring uh, in service to others is quite beautiful. So thank you for all of that. Thank you so much, Martin. These are such sweet and kind words. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to uh, participate in your book. I'm really looking forward to learn about other people and their facilitation uh, uh, ways. Uh, there's always something to learn and something to, uh, to uh, bring back to uh, my own practice. Why not? And thank you for having me second time on the podcast and uh, making that room and understanding what uh, this spirit went through mm. after the first uh, mm -hmm. it, it was quite something and I am so very grateful that uh, it happened that way and that you um, found time for me today again thank you yeah well I'm glad we could do it all right well thank you so much Magda all right thank you have a lovely day okay mm. you too